And you wrote this in one of your articles. This is actually what inspired me to contact you. I'm going to read this quote. You said, one can understand Judaism on its own terms without reference to Christianity. Well, Christianity can be understood only in terms of Judaism, which I read that and I thought that was like the key to understanding so much of my interaction with Christians. למען ציון לא אכשה, ולמען ירושלים לא אשקוט. You are listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at nehemiaswall.com. Shalom, this is Nehemia Gordon with Hebrew Voices, and today I am at the Marcus Family Campus of the Ben-Gurion University of the Negev in Be'er Sheva, Israel. And today we have on the program Professor Daniel J. Lasker, who is the Norbert Bleschner Professor of Jewish Values in the Goldstein Gorin Department of Jewish Thought. He is the author of six books and over 200 other publications in the fields of Jewish philosophy, the Jewish Christian debate, and charism. In addition to Ben Gurion University, Professor Lasker has taught at University of Toronto, Yale University, Princeton University, Ohio State University, University of Texas, University of Washington, and other institutions. Shalom, Professor Lasker. Shalom, Nathamia. Now you are, it says in your bio, an expert on uh, Karaite Judaism, but today we're actually going to talk about the Jewish-Christian debate. And I think we need to give some background because I don't know that my audience knows too much about these Jewish-Christian debates in the Middle Ages. So here's what I know. So around the year 150 AD or CE, there was a, a Christian named Justin Martyr who wrote a book called Dialogues with Trifo, which is a systematic, I guess, attack on Judaism a systematic defense of Christianity from his perspective and, and deconstruction attack on Judaism. And you're saying there wasn't anything like that in the first eight centuries where a Jew sat down and said, let me write something to prove the Christians are wrong. But they did tell stories about Jesus, which maybe were even a parody meant to be a little bit insulting, maybe. Yeah, I think that that's accurate. The dialogue with Trypho or Tryphon of Justin was not the first Christian polemical work, but it's uh, one of the first important ones. And then in the period of the Church Fathers until the 5th century or so, there are many works in the genre known as adversus judeos against the Jews. And you have them in Greek, then you have in Latin, you have in... So wait, wait, so this was a, a type of book that people would write? A Christian would sit down and say, okay, today I'm not going to write poetry, I'm going to write adversus judeos against the Jews. And that, and that was like a type of writing, and you're saying the Jews didn't have that category of correct of the Jews did not Christians. have a parallel genre of this type of writing against Christianity uh, one should keep in mind though in during this period the eight for, first eight Christian centuries there are very few if no Jewish discrete compositions on specific topics. In other words, you have the Talmud, you have the Midrash, or the different Midrashim, the uh, legendary works, you have the interpretations, but you don't have a book by a, an identified author on a specific topic. This enters Judaism partially, or maybe a great amount, under the influence of Islam and Islamic uh, literary genres. So if you say we don't have a book against Christianity in the first uh, eight Christian centuries, we also don't have a specific book on a specific legal topic. We don't have a commentary on the, a running commentary in the Bible, which became an important genre in the Middle Ages. We don't have any theological works, whereas Christians, the church fathers and afterwards, spent a lot of time discussing Christian theological notions like Trinity, Incarnation. We don't have anything parallel in Judaism. So it's not only that Jews were not into polemicizing, arguing against, trying to criticize, refute Christianity, but it was a different, uh, as I said, literary Jews use different literary expressions. And can you define polemics for us? Because Christians will often talk today about apologetics, which they mean defense of their faith. W what is a polemic? Polemics and apologetics are often interchangeable. I don't have a particular definition when I deal with it. I deal with a genre of works in which Jews either defend Jewish interpretation of Jewish sources against Christian or sometimes Muslim attacks, or they attempt refutations of the doctrines of the competing religions. So it's a work which is dedicated to 
argumentation. And if one wants to have a, a modern contemporary example, we do have in the religious spheres, but if you look at the political spheres, if you look at political debates and how each contestant, or I don't know, or nominee deals with the opponent, it's very much polemical, showing why the opponent is wrong and why one's own views are correct. And these political debates use many of the same, how should I say it, same, many of the same conventions as religious polemics do in terms of overstatement, in terms of distortion, in terms of looking for the correct argument sometimes at the expense of what one really knows to be the case or really believes. This is something I've experienced in especially reading and hearing debates on religion, is that often someone, and I, I, it's amazing to me hearing you say this, that often they'll bring an argument that sounds good in the debate even though they know it's not really true. It, it wouldn't be what they, you know, it's, it's almost like in the Talmud or in the Mishnah, maybe there's this certain type of thing where they, they respond something to the Romans and they say, Rebbe, that's what you told the Romans. What do you tell us? <laughs> right. So one of the best examples is uh, a work that I uh, published and, and translated. It's called The Refutation of the Christian Principles, written by late 14th, early 15th century, very prominent Jewish philosopher rabbis, name was Chastai Crescas. He was in Spain and Catalonia, Aragon. His only son was murdered in the anti-Jewish riots in 1391. And he wrote a book in the vernacular. He actually wrote two books in the vernacular, which is probably Catalan. So he didn't write these books in Hebrew. He wrote them in Catalanese or whatever that language right, is called. Catalan. And only one was translated. The one's called the Refutation, known today as the Refutation of the Christian Principles. And in that work, he used arguments which in his philosophical work, The Light of the Lord, he uses exactly the opposite argumentation. So that, for instance, when discussing Trinity and the possibility of the eternal generation of the Son from the Father, he argues that there can't be, there can be no possible way in which there's eternal generation from God. What does eternal generation mean? That there eternally God was always producing the Son. That's an official Christian doctrine. Correct. That the Son, the second person, the Trinity. Meaning, so Jesus wasn't produced at one point in history, according to Christian theology, but he was always being generated? No. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Philosophy isn't my area. The Trinity, <laughs> Christian belief in the Trinity is that there are three co-equal persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that the Father generated the Son, in other words, from the person of the Father was produced the person of the Son. And then in Western Christianity, from the persons of the Father and the Son, the Spirit proceeded. Wait, so according to this, and I love this, I'm here at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev, and a, a Jewish professor is explaining to me the Trinity. <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. Wait, so, and this is in Western Christianity, you're saying that Jesus didn't always exist according uh, to no. them? Jesus, the person, obviously didn't always exist. Jesus, the person, was born. Well, the second person of the Trinity. And this is according to Christian theology, not what you believe or what I believe. Yeah, I'm talking about Christian theology. Yeah. So first of all, when I said Western Christianity, the difference between West and East, and this is complicated, is that according to Eastern Christianity, the Son was not involved in the procession of the Spirit. So in Eastern Christianity, the Father generated the Son and caused the Spirit to proceed. In Western Christianity, the Father generated the Son, the Father and the Son caused the Spirit to proceed. And this is why the Catholics consider the Greek Orthodox heretics and vice versa over this concept that you just explained that I, I'll be honest, I don't truly understand, but continue, please. Okay, it's known it, in the business, in the, the it's called the filioque uh, uh -huh. word. That didn't so, help me. Okay. <laughs> no, please go filioque on. Filioque means and the Son. It's, so oh, on, okay. this, on this one word, they, they discuss. And, and you know, I'll be honest, I've read some of this stuff and it goes in, you know, in one eye and out the other. But, but no, I do find this stuff fascinating. So I want to understand this. So the eternal generation of the Son, according to Western Christianity. So at one time, the Jesus wasn't generated? Well, again, to distinguish between the Son and Jesus. Okay, the Son. Let's, let's talk okay. about God. God has three persons. All three persons are God. All three persons are eternal. If all three persons are eternal, how can we say the Father generated the Son and caused the Spirit to proceed? The answer is that this was an eternal process. So that that is always the case from eternity that 
God the Father generated God the Son, and the two of them, according to Western Christianity. Okay, so this is the Christian doctrine that Crescas is coming against. Right, and yeah. this has nothing to do with Jesus. What it has to do with okay. Jesus is Jesus is the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity. In other words, one of the persons of the Trinity, and of course Jews object to this, they said if all three are God, how could one be separated off to become incarnate in a human being. But ignoring the issue of Jesus, what Crescas says is that eternal generation is impossible, that it's a contradiction in terms. You can't have a generation procedure proceeding from generating like a child that occurs eternally. In his philosophical work, he defends the possibility of the eternal generation of the world. In other words, the world could be eternal and not created at a particular whoa, moment. Whoa, 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 whoa. Because what I was always taught was, you know, Rambam, Yesh Me'ayin, Maimonides taught that the world was created ex nihilo, out of nothing. And you're saying that there were Jewish philosophers, this Chastai Kreskas, who said that the world itself may be eternal? Correct. And it's very close to what Thomas wow. Aquinas said, or at least the possibility of an eternal world. The possibility. Wait, so then how does he explain, I'm a Bible person, so how does he explain, you know, Bereshit bara Elohim at the in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth? As Maimonides points out in The Guide of the Perplexed, Part 2, Chapter 25, the belief in the eternity or creation of the world is not dependent upon what appears to be the literal meaning of the text in Genesis. This okay. is a philosophical question, and one should interpret the text according to one's philosophical... Uh, ah, okay, that's views. very interesting. So, <laughs> in other words, you don't base your philosophy on the text, you base your understanding of the text based on your philosophy according to Maimonides. Is that right? Or? I, I would say it right, except for the fact that you say your philosophy, Maimonides would say philosophy. Okay, the true philosophy. Okay. Reason. And how do you figure out philosophy? Through an intellectual process or... Correct. This is okay. philosophy or science. Science and philosophy were were identical in the, the Middle Ages. Look, and, and I don't know that I would necessarily entirely disagree with that in the sense that, you know, if, if um, I read about the four corners of the earth and I've uh, seen satellite photos that show the earth is round that I'm not going to insist that the earth is flat and has four corners. So I'm going to interpret the Bible based on information that I know from, as you say, from science. So go back to Crescas. So I'm saying you have in Crescas's philosophical work arguments which he rejected in his polemical work and vice versa. So there have been a number of attempts over the years to explain why there's these contradictions. There is a view that one work was written before the other work, and therefore he changed his mind. My view on these things is that there's a difference between the polemical genre and the philosophical genre. And in the polemics, one can say things that one doesn't uh, necessarily agree with, but are, are good arguments. And again, if you look at the political arguments today, that so-and-so is a danger to society and so are the, the other candidates and all these other things people say about the other candidates, they might not necessarily really believe. And after the elections, two, two people that couldn't stand each other suddenly make a coalition. Or in the U.S., after the primaries, after terrible things people said about each other, they make coalitions or they or they support each other in the elections. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Let me give an example that I've encountered myself from Jewish Christian debates. So they'll be talking about a certain passage in the Bible, in the Tanakh. That's the ones I was interested in. And there'll be a rabbi and he'll bring an argument and he'll say, look, what you Christians say isn't the plain meaning, the pshat. What he doesn't bring up is that the way he lives his life on a daily basis is not according to the pshat. And he's completely comfortable with that. But in the context of the debate, he's not going to say, well, the, this is a a valid midrashic interpretation the Christians are bringing of, I don't know, Isaiah 53, he's going to say, no, if we want to understand this, we have to look at the pshat. That's the true interpretation. Even though in his actual implementation of halakha, he's not so concerned with pshat. So that seems to me to be a contradiction of principles. Well, in terms of methodology, I would say that one's exegesis is influenced by one's theology and not the other way around. It's just as I Explain said, that in simple terms. Okay. One's interpretation is based on how you... One's interpretation, the text is based on one's theological beliefs. What the Christians would say, exactly what you said, is the Jews relied upon the physical text, which you call the pshat, the well, plain meaning, the contextual meaning. And Judaism is a carnal, is a physical, bodily understanding of the 
Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament for Christianity, whereas Christians are spiritual. So that works sometimes, it doesn't work other times. So for instance, if you look at Christian belief, the Catholic belief in transubstantiation is based on verses in Matthew and the other Gospels, where Jesus at the Last Supper says, this is my body, this is my blood, referring to the, the bread and the wine at the Last Supper. And Christians, or Catholics at least, say this should be taken literally. When Jesus says, this is my body, this is his body. And when he says, this is my blood, this is, uh, this is uh, actual blood. And famously in the Reformation, people lost their lives in the Christian world for saying, no, that's not to be taken literally. You know, Martin Luther particularly came out against this, that, he, that the wafer wasn't literally turned into the body of Jesus. And the Catholics said, no, you have to believe it was literally so that's an example of what then? That the Christians are literalists? So in certain cases, the Christians are literalists. In terms of Judaism and literal interpretation or allegorical interpretation, theology as opposed to law, the general rule of thumb among Jews is that the text should be understood literally unless there is some other elutes. Um, requirement or something that forces you to interpret it otherwise. Right. So that... The Sa'adja Gaon, I mentioned in the 10th century, said that if you have two verses whose literal meaning contradict each other, then one has to uh, reinterpret one of them. If you have the tradition contradicts it, you have to... Uh, so that's very interesting. So there's Occam's razor, which says all things being equal, the simplest interpretation is the best. And in a sense, this is Sa'adja's razor. All things being equal, the literal interpretation is the best. And when are not all things equal? When there's two contradictory verses or there's a tradition that forces you to interpret differently. It's very, very interesting. Or reasoned uh, requires you. In Saj's okay. ah, yeah, Saj's translation of the Bible, we have in Genesis that Eve is called Eve Chava because she's Aim Kol Chai. She's yeah. the mother of all living. So Saj knows that Eve is not the mother of all living because we have animals and we have plants who are living. So he translates aim, the mother of all chai natik, in Arabic uh, law, uh, reasoning or thinking or ta uh, speaking. In other words, she is the mother of all rational animals. So okay. he adds the word rational to the verse, to the translation, which is not in the text, but he has to translate it. He has to interpret his exegesis is a result of his knowledge that Eve is not the mother of all living. This is a really good example of what I call over-literalization. In other words, you know, some people come with the attitude and say everything has to be taken literally, and then you end up with Eve being the mother of, you know, donkeys and polar bears, and which is, you know, obviously not what the text meant. I say obviously, but when I say obviously, I mean through logic and rational thought. And that's what you're saying, that that, that is a valid uh, criteria criterion for uh, determining what the shot is or when to take. I mean, that, that I would say is the difference between the shot, as I define it, and, and the literal interpretation. Uh, like it says, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Even the most literal Karaite in the world wouldn't say we have to have open heart surgery and cut off a piece of our heart because the logic tells me God isn't going to give me a commandment to, you know, well, we don't have surgery to cut my heart open. And hearts don't have foreskins. You know, maybe someone will discover there's an extra piece of fat on the heart and we can cut it off now with surgery. But Bacholzo, you know, despite that, nobody in their right mind would say that that's what it means. I had an example of this. I did an interview with the um, uh, leader of the Raelian movement, which is a, a UFO religion. And he said, I, you know, you, I show you all these verses in the Bible and it talks about God riding on a cloud clearly. This is a spaceship. And I said, it's a metaphor. And he says, so many metaphors. <laughs> and, and my point is, yes, there's many metaphors. And that is the shot in those contexts. There's this great statement in Rashi's commentary on Shira Shirim, where he says, pshutohu mashal. It's shot as an allegory, which is beautiful. It's a beautiful contrast of, of uh, the plain meaning as an allegory. I and mean, he might be wrong. You might disagree with him. But this concept of pshat is broad enough to include allegory. I don't know how we got into the topic of pshat. Oh, because we're talking about in debates, sometimes the Jewish side will say, no, you've got to interpret according to the pshat, the based on the language and the context using common sense. And the Christian interpretation is, is it's not by accident. They're intentionally not looking at the context. Because of their theology, because of their theological uh, commitments. If going back to this issue of whether or not the polemicist believed what he was writing, I can give you another great example yeah. that a late 13th century work called Nisachon Yashan, the old book of polemic, uh, written in uh, France, Germany in the late 13th century, starts out with the Christian claim that the verse in Genesis 126, let us make man 
in our likeness after our image refers to God the Father talking to God the Son or to the Trinity. And it's a plural used because the one God has multiple aspects. And that's the Christian explanation. And that's the Christian okay. explanation. So the author, we don't know his name, says, you're actually right. God the Father does say to God the Son, help me out and let's create man. And God the Son says, I don't want to and doesn't help out because in the continuation says he created in the singular and not they created. <laughs> Wait and, a minute, and, what? And, and, and as a result of this... This is a Jewish polemical work. Right. As a result of this, when the Son... Jesus was on the cross and says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God's answer is you didn't help me when I created man. Well, I'm not going to help you when you're getting... Uh... Stop, Professor. You're saying this isn't a Jewish polemical work, a Jewish apology in response to Christianity. Oh, and you're bringing this as an example. He obviously didn't really believe that. Correct. This okay. Is, he, he's Does, writing wait. this for entertainment oh. value. So he's being sarcastic in a way. Correct. Extremely. But he doesn't say, hey, I'm being sarcastic. No. Wow. So you have wow. many of these interpretations, and the the issue of the nastiness of the tone of the debate, some people have tried to say it's connected to pressure, what, what the pressure on Jews was, but I think it has more to do with what kind of audience the author intended. So Ashkenazi Jewry, Franco-German Jewry, were used to a certain style of nastiness. What, did they write that way about each other? Uh, sometimes. Meaning if there's two rabbis debating... It's not always in a respectful tone. Correct. But you have that also among non-Franco-German Jews, okay. <laughs> among the Sephardim. But what I'm saying is that there's a certain entertainment value of the material, and some of the entertainment is by use of extreme language, and some of the entertainment value is in terms of wild accusations, and some of it is by telling what's obviously jokes, namely that, yes, of course, let us make man refers to the plural Godhead, but this is, it has a consequence. This is fascinating because a thousand years from now, some scholar may come and read Nitzachon Yashan and say the Jews of Germany did believe in a trinity. And they had, uh, I don't know if, I don't even know what this would be called. It's, it sounds to me almost like some form of Gnosticism where, uh, you know, God actually did uh, abandon Jesus on the cross. And, and, it, and, and in this case, it was revenge because he didn't help him create the, the world. This is a, astounding. And you're saying he was saying this basically as a, as, as a joke, as sarcasm. Yeah, but you don't have to look wow. for a thousand years from now. You see, when the subject of humor in the polemics is something which many people have not dealt with because they think this is such serious literature, that this is something that questions of life and death the polemicists would not be joking. You talked about Christian pressure. So once we get to Jews living under Christian rule, what was it like for them, and especially vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, dealing with, um, you know, polemics? Okay, so in medieval Christendom, I'm talking about mostly Western Europe, there was no such thing as citizenship. There's no such thing as equality before the law. It was a feudal society in which there are a number of different estates. There is the nobility, there is the serfs, there is uh, the guilds, the, the craftsmen, and there was no neutral society where one was just a citizen. So Jews had their own individual identification and communities, recognized communities. They often had charters offered by the local either religious or civil authorities, which uh, outline their privileges and their responsibilities. Often they had more taxes than uh, Christians. They often had a certain amount of self-rule in terms of their local courts could decide things. During this period, I would say overall, Jews and Christians got along as neighbors get along. They celebrated each other's family events and they talked to each other. And they uh, and they, you have examples of that from the literature? Well, we see that there's a, in late 12th century Southern France, there is a, um, called an ethical will written by Judah Ibn Tibon to his son Samuel. And he mentions Judah's, he meant, Judah mentions Samuel's wedding in which he had their all the local Christian clergy and, and uh, nobles. And we have many Jewish customs which seem to be related or, or influenced by, or as I said, the problem with influence, but at least in the context of Christian uh, ceremony. So that Jews in, in France, Germany, when a child, when a son was uh, reached the age of six, usually 
at the Shavuot ceremony, the the festival of Pentecost, Shavuot, would have a ceremony of introducing the child into the study of Torah and would uh, give out candies and put honey on the page. And there's an extremely parallel ceremony in the Christian communities. You say in, in France and in, in Germany in the Middle Ages, I saw that in the 20th century. In other words, when the Jew, the, the boy's three years old and he first learns to read, the, the words are sweet and he... And he uh, right, it was a, but it was... But you a, say it goes back a thousand years or so to France? Yeah, there, and there, there were Sefer Chassidim, mm-hmm. uh, which is a 13th century mystical pietistic work, includes a number of practices such as penitential practices if someone has sinned one should uh, roll around naked in the in the uh, snow and all kinds of uh, and this comes from christian and influence? there are well, i would say there are parallels in christianity at the uh, same time so we don't know that the jews learn it from the christians the christians learn it from or, the jews or, or it was as i said it's like guys it's the uh the, what people did at the time yes yeah, so that's what people okay. did okay so we know that there is much contact between jews and christians however it often happens that the Christian, either religious or civil authorities, used antagonism to Jews for their own purposes. And there are certain times when this was a uh, safety valve, let's say, to uh, divert the local populations from their own problems. Sometimes it was a way of arousing religious fervor so that in the Crusades, when the Christians in Europe decided to take back, or what they thought was taking back the Holy Land from the Muslims, sort of whipping up enthusiasm for getting the heretics, included massacring Jews on the way from Europe to uh, the land of Israel. There were special taxes for Jews. These weren't tax breaks, these were additional taxes. Additional taxes. In starting in 1290 in England, there were expulsions of Jews. There were accusations of Jewish malfeasance in terms of ritual murder of Christians, use of Christian blood for ritual purposes, and also we talked about the the host, uh, the wafer. So can you explain that a bit? So those were two major accusations against the Jews. I think it's worth you know, stopping a minute and talking about those, there was the blood libels and the desecration of the host. For those who have no idea what they are, what what are those accusations? Well, the accusation is that Jews needed blood in order to make, uh, for ritual purposes, most notably for the matzot, the unleavened bread for a Passover. And it even came to the point that in the traditional requirement is that one use red wine for the Passover Seder, for the four cups of the Passover Seder, it got to the point where some authorities suggested that it would be better to use white wine at the Seder so that no one thinks that there's any blood in the, the red wine. So this was an accusation the Christians made against the Jews. This was like an almost like an institutional accusation, wasn't it? It depends on the place. The, and the popes generally tried to restrain but My these. point is it was something that went on generation after generation. Correct. That the Jews were killing, they were killing Christian children and using their blood for ritual purposes. Correct. And this wasn't just some hypothetical accusation. People died because of this accusation, Correct. right? And you also have the uh, colleague of mine was just in Austria, near the city where one of these events occurred, case of William of Trent in the, I think, the 15th century. And despite the fact that the Christian Church, the Catholic Church, says he's not a saint, and this is not a, this was not a, a real event, etc. This is still a place of pilgrimage for certain Catholics. And just to be clear, this is the child who was allegedly killed by Jews has now become a pace a, a, a object of worship or a saint. Well, adoration. this often happened often happened in the Middle Ages, okay. and places of pilgrimage, which is also one of the reasons why it was in the interest of the locals, at least, to propagate this belief because that cause special... So can we, and I hear I'm just, I'm thinking out loud. So, you know, imagine there's some young Christian boy, he's walking through the woods and he slips and he breaks his neck and, you know, cuts himself and the blood spills out. They find this body a week later. It's, it's a horrific sight and they blame the Jews. Like that, that could have literally happened. And then you say it's in their interest to say he's, he was killed by the Jews because now he's a saint and people come on as basically tourists, pilgrimage, and bring money into the community. Correct. This could be some of the the motive behind it. Also, sometimes it, perhaps it wasn't an accident. Perhaps the child was, was murdered by parents or murdered by 
other Christians. Mm -hmm. and, and they to, blame the Jews. And to divert uh, attention. The other thing was the host desecration, as I mentioned. And the host is? Catholics believe that the bread, the wafer, which is called the host of the Eucharist, of the Mass, the service of the Mass, turns into the actual body of Jesus, and the wine turns into the actual blood of Jesus. And they accused Jews of acquiring this bread. The stealing wafer. it, pretty much. Right? Well, either stealing or it, or buy. sometimes it would be used as a collateral for loans, or... There, there was, Is that true that it would be used as collateral for loans? Yeah, because it was oh. because it was a very important item. Um, wait, wait, wait. So a Catholic is borrowing money for a Jew, and the Jew says, I know there's one thing that you want to get back, and that's this wafer. Well, I don't so know let me it, hold on to the wafer. Well, I don't know if it's in that way. It's, the person who takes a loan needs something to come up with that— uh, And he comes up with a wafer. Right. Uh, but most— m wow. the I never heard of that. The no. accusation is that the Jews would— torture the wafer of bread just to show that it didn't happen, or, or because just as Jews crucified Jesus, they are now attacking his body by piercing it or cutting it. And in many of these Christian stories, the wafer begins to uh, bleed, and then they understand that it actually is flesh. Sometimes Mary, the mother of Jesus, intervenes to, uh, to save the, her son's flesh. Uh, which is the wafer. Which is the wafer. And, and I want to make it clear, I'm not belittling Catholic belief. You know, Catholics may even still believe this. I, I'm not an expert. But the point is, Jews wouldn't, in other words, the, the image here is Jews got this wafer and they're sticking needles in it to torture it because they know it's the body of Jesus and Jews hate Jesus. In other words, there's a series of accusations here that A, Jews hate Jesus. B, they know that Jesus really is 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 alive in this wafer. And because of their hatred of, of Jesus, they're torturing it. And so accusing a Jew of attacking the body of Christ is this age-old anti-Semitic theme, motif, slur. I mean, which just roused up the hatred of the Christians of the time who took these things very literally and okay. maybe still do. Okay. One could also understand it in a slightly different way, yeah. which is since Christians themselves had their own doubts as to the truth of the Christian th doctrine that this piece of bread is actually the body or the uh, the flesh of the literal Christ, body of Christ. literal body of symbolic. Christ if they can argue that even the Jews believe it is and how do we know that the Jews believe that the host is Jesus' body because they steal it and torture it because they believe it so it all adds up into the sort of the image of the Jew as the one who proves the truth of Christianity by their own stubbornness and and blindness in the Christian belief wow so these accusations in a sense we talked about apology and polemic these are in a sense an internal argument for Christianity to prove its own truth by saying, even the Jews know this body is real, that this is literally the body. That's why they torture it, because they hate Jesus so much. So, so I'm looking at it from the perspective of this is how they're whipping up hatred for the Jews. And you're saying there's an aspect here where they want to confirm the um, internal faith for those who are like, wait a minute, this is a cracker. What? Like, I would say that's wow, part, of the, part wow. of the motive behind the host This is amazing. Stuff. What, when you call this safety valve, what, explain what you meant by that from the Christian perspective. Just as today or throughout history, when there is either economic uncertainty or even uh, health uncertainty during the, the, uh, the Black Plague of 1380, uh, 1348, or people are worried, people are afraid, it's useful for the authorities to have a scapegoat. And the Jews generally played the role as a scapegoat because the Jews are the ultimate other in Western Christendom. Unlike in Islam, which tolerated Judaism and Christianity and certain other groups, in Christianity, the only non-Christian group that was tolerated was Jews. Heretical Christians were not were not accepted. Muslims were generally not accepted. So that you have in the, an internal crusade in the, the 13th century in southern France against heretics, and you have the wars of the 16th century. And again, that's heretics as the Catholic Church defined it at that time. Correct. So you, so if you were, you, so you had two choices basically. If you were in Catholic Europe, you could be a Christian if you were born a Christian, and if you happen to be born a Jew. That was tolerated. And, and I once heard it described that tolerated is different than accepted. When you tolerate something, it really means you can't stand it, but you allow it to exist. It, and would you say it was tolerance in that sense? Well, it was useful for the Catholic majority to have 
a despised minority. And this goes back to Augustine. I mentioned Augustine in the late 4th century, where he basically says Jews should be tolerated because they are proof of the truth of Christianity. They have the original text, and even though they misunderstand the Bible, they can prove the truth of Christianity. And the fact that they are kept in a stage of subjugation and discriminated against and poverty, etc., this just shows that they are rejected by God for not accepting God's Messiah and not understanding the Bible correctly. And this was particularly important for the Christian mission for, towards the, the pagans of the time or the residual elements of Roman pagan Greek paganism. Am I right that, you know, they would go to the pagans and say, you know, Jesus is the fulfillment of these ancient prophecies. And the pagans might say, what prophecies? And they'd say, well, the Jews preserved those books. Well, I don't know if, if it, it was exactly in, in that manner, but certainly at different times in history of Christianity, there were different perceptions of the importance of the Hebrew text or the or the uh, or the original text, the Veritas Hebraica, the Hebrew truth, was important in the the twelfth century in France, for instance. And you have Christian exegetes, interpreters of the Bible, who had contact with Jewish interpreters of the Bible. So all these things we're talking about today are very very complex, and the I would say the traditional Jewish understanding of Jewish life under Christianity as one unmitigated disaster after another and one series of discrimination and one of discrimination and expulsions and higher taxes, et cetera, et cetera, is really a very simplistic way of looking at, at history. As I said, most of the time things were all right. Until they weren't. Until I mean, they weren't. Okay. So let's go back to this concept of the, the pressure valve. And, and, and an example that comes to mind is, is something from more recent history, when you had the czarist regime ruling over Russia and the Russian peasants, they basically didn't have the, the mandate of the people. Not basically, they didn't have the mandate of the people. They were this dictatorship. And rather than people lash out against the czar, he would then have his agents go and stir up hatred against the Jews. And now instead of the peasants attacking the czar, they're attacking the local Jews. And if I'm not mistaken, an example of this was the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was actually created by the czarist uh, secret police for this exact purpose, as you call it a pressure valve, from the perspective of the dictatorship. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, pretty accurate. Uh, it could be remembered that the last great blood libel trial was the Bayless trial in 1912 under the czars. So that even in the 20th century, Jews were accused of this blood libel. And they still are in the 21st century in Muslim countries. Correct. The, the, the uh, idea that Jews use Christian blood or non-Jewish blood for ritual purposes has now been adopted along with many other anti-Semitic uh, motifs by Muslims who, until the 20th century, the 19th century, were relatively tolerant of Jews, as long as Jews understood that they were what we call second-class citizens, but or people with a different status. In other words, by law in Muslim countries, Jews were second-class citizens, and in a sense, in Christianity, they barely even had that status, meaning they, they were a tolerated group of foreigners. Well, again, this idea of citizenship and second class is really anachronistic, but in Islam, Christians and Jews and sometimes other groups were considered people of the book who had restrictions, including paying a poll tax, an individual poll tax, including the height of uh, synagogues and, and churches. Some places they weren't allowed to build new churches or synagogues under Muslim rule, and Jews and Christians were not allowed to ride horses. So Maimonides, for instance, when he describes a messianic period, says we don't want the Messiah so they'll be riding, so we can ride on horses. I mean, it seems ridiculous oh. that, you, <laughs> that someone would want the Messiah in order to ride on horses, but the idea is that Jews would no longer have these uh, discrimination. According to Maimonides, one wants the Messiah in order to have the leisure to achieve the truth. There's this great example of that, a little bit off topic, but there's this commentary by the curate Daniel Akumisi on the book of Daniel. And, and there's a verse there in Daniel where he's talking about the, um, I think it's uh, the, the three friends of Daniel. And it says, you know, uh, something like, Ham Yehudim, they, they were Jews. Uh, or maybe this is Yefet Ben Eli. One of these commentators, he makes the remark that when it says in Daniel that they were Jews, it does, and, and it's actually, I think it's one of the, the Babylonians who says this. He, he explains they didn't mean it in a negative way. Because in Islamic countries, you know, that, that was the worst curse you could say upon someone. Why Yahud, may you become a Jew. I think it is, still is one of the worst curses. 
I mean, in, in their culture, you had to explain, no, calling somebody a Jew wasn't an insult. They just happened to be from Judea. <laughs> it, it's hard to wrap our heads around that. I, I want to go back to the blood libels, in, which started out in, in, in the Christian world. So, you know, my father once, who was, who was a rabbi of blessed memory, he, he once said, um, he said, how do we know that the blood libels aren't true? And he said, because according to halacha, according to rabbinical law, you can't make the matzah with anything but room temperature water. For example, it says you can't use fruit juice to make matzahs. And therefore, you couldn't use blood. And I said, Dad, is that the reason we know it's not true? <laughs> He's giving a halakhic reason, trying to argue with people who are just have this fanatical anti-Semitism. But of course, he's coming at it as, as a halakhist. I'm not sure fanatical anti-Semitism is, right, is exactly the okay. correct term. How would you describe it? That you have in Christianity an opposition to Judaism, and there is a uh, resentment to Jews for continuing to be Jews. And some of the Christians developed, or for the reasons you mentioned, sometimes Christian uh, children would disappear or be found dead. And it was, in a sense, easier to scapegoat the Jews than to actually investigate it. So I'm not saying that the, the that all Christians loved all Jews, but that this idea that the blood libel or even the host desecration were purely the result of what you called fanatical anti-Semitism. I, I, I'm not sure that's the correct Maybe it's a latent anti-Semitism. I, I want to share a story. I, I, was, um, I was in Florida, and I had some spare time on my hands, and I decided I would go one Sunday morning to a megachurch, which I've never been to a megachurch service. I thought this would be interesting. I, I want to see what it's all about. So I go to this church, and there's probably like 20,000 people in this church. It was an interesting experience. And look, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Messianic Jew. I'm going there as, as you know, what they would call an unbeliever. And I'm just a fly on the wall, you know, hearing what they're saying. And it was very interesting, by the way. It was, it was the way I've described it to other Jews is it was basically a Christian rock concert with a sermon in the middle. And, and that's, to, from my perspective, what it very much seemed like. You know, they had a band, which literally with drums and rock and roll and uh, Christian songs. And, and so during the sermon, the pastor or whoever gets up there and he, and he starts reading from some passage in the New Testament. And he's, you know, and he's, I would say he's taking it out of context, but he's presenting about how the Jews are the ones who rejected Christ. And his message was, don't be like those Jews. And I'm sitting there, I'm, I can't even believe this. He doesn't know I'm in the audience. So I set up a meeting with this guy and the head pastor there. And I said, you know, I've, I've got to talk to them about this. So I go into this meeting and, and he turns to me and he says, he says, look, the only thing that's really important is, is what do you do with Jesus? And I said, I, you know, I came here to talk about what I perceived as this anti-Semitic, like he used the Jews as a motif of hatred and a motif of, you know, don't be Jews. And there's, I'm a real Jew, you know, I find this very offensive, you know, and, and look, there's other verses in the New Testament you could have brought, like, when, you know, when Paul says, what advantage has the Jews? You know, there, there's other things in the New Testament you could have brought about Jews. And then he says to me, well, he says, look, I, I, either Jesus is your Lord or you're telling me he's Hitler. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and he says, what do you do with Hitler? Hitler did some good things. And I said, what are you talking about? And he says, well, you know, Hitler did, said some good things and, and Jesus said good things. And so either you accept him as your Lord and it was this false dichotomy or you're saying Jesus is Hitler. I'm saying those are my two options. And so this isn't a, you're right, it's not a rabid anti-Semitism. This is a latent anti-Semitism. To me, this felt very, um, I'm sitting here and I imagine now being a 500 years earlier and I'm living under Christian rule. I ha really have no rights under the law. And this is what they're preaching from the pulpit? Well, the part of the justification for Christianity throughout the centuries has been the fact that Judaism has been superseded, that the New Testament- Replaced. Replaced. The New Testament is the- legitimate, authentic sequel to the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And just as rabbinic Jews see the Talmud as the authentic and authoritative sequel to the Hebrew Bible, Christians see that in the New Testament and in the Christian uh, traditions which have developed. Part of the, I won't say the trick, but part of the goal of many people who are involved in Jewish-Christian dialogue today, both Jews and Christians, is to see if there's some sort of way in which Christianity could have validity without necessarily denigrating legitimacy of Judaism. This is a Christian concern basically only since the Shoah, when the Holocaust, the Holocaust when the Christians understood that some Christians understood that traditional Christian doctrine of delegitimization of Jews and demonization of Jews 
could lead to mass murder. And some of them are looking for ways of understanding Christianity, which is not denigration of Judaism. So, for instance, the idea of the two covenants, that there is the original covenant with the Jews and the uh, second covenant with the rest of the world, which would be for Christianity. That's one particular Christian theology. That's one, which especially those among whom uh, were engaged in in dialogue. I mean, there are many Christians who have no problems with the fact that Christianity superseded Judaism, and Judaism is is not legitimate. And, and And you wrote this in one of your articles. This is actually what inspired me to contact you. I'm going to read this quote. You said, one can understand Judaism on its own terms without reference to Christianity. Well, Christianity can be understood only in terms of Judaism, which I I read that and I thought that was like the key to understanding so much of my interaction with Christians. When I'll meet a Christian or someone who believes in the New Testament and they'll they'll come to me and they'll say, why don't you believe in Jesus? So they'll say Yeshua. And I don't even understand the question. I don't define myself in terms of why I do or, you know, of, of Christianity. And what you're saying there is, historically at least, Christianity couldn't exist without explaining itself within the context of Judaism. It had to explain Judaism in one way or another, or it couldn't exist, whereas Judaism, being more ancient than Christianity, we don't even think in those terms. Am I right? In other words, it would be almost like if I came to somebody, and, and I hope no, no Christian is offended by this, and, and I was a ra- alien, and I said, why don't you believe in Claude Volion as, as, um, as the prophet? Why would I need to explain why I don't believe in, in you know? In well, the, why go there? I, you know, why not in Buddhism? Okay, why so, not you, so give that example. Yeah. No, I'm saying is that you could ask a Christian, why don't you accept Buddha as the enlightened one? And they also would have no context in which to... It's like, why, I don't even ask that question as, as, as a Jew. And, and you're saying a Christian doesn't even think about, why don't I accept Buddha? And, and that's what it sounds like to us as Jews is, is you know, it's, it's basically what you're saying in this statement. So can you, can you elaborate on that? Well, let, let me qualify the statement yeah. to a certain extent. I do not mean that Judaism over the years has not been influenced by Christianity. Now, in the last uh, few decades, there's been a major scholarly debate as to the exact relationship between Judaism and Christianity in the first few Christian centuries. There used to be talked about the parting of the ways, that Christianity developed within Judaism, and then Christianity left Judaism. Then they're trying to uh, discover when exactly Christianity no longer was a Jewish sect. Uh, Now there's more and more an emphasis on Jews and Christians reacting to each other and influence each other to the extent that you have, instead of the paradigm of Judaism as the mother and Christianity as the daughter, some people talk in terms of Judaism and Christianity as sisters or siblings because they both developed, as I said, they're both considered to be sequels to the Hebrew Bible. And you even have those who go to extreme uh, extremes to say that even the rabbinic Judaism, in a sense, is the daughter of Christianity because rabbinic Judaism is a reaction to Christianity. I wish the people could see the look on my face of utter shock. How could rabbinical Judaism be the daughter of Christianity? What is that? Because you have many concepts of rabbinic Judaism which, according to this view, of which I'm not, I don't agree. Well, you're saying there's some scholars who say this? There's some scholars who say this, that you have martyrdom, for instance. The whole idea of martyrdom in, in Judaism is, is reaction to martyrdom in Christianity. If you look at, the, there's some work, some of the work, for instance, the Passover Seder, that some people, the Passover uh, meal and, and ritual is reaction to Christianity and the Last Supper. You have any number of places where rabbinic Judaism is understood as a reaction to Christian challenges or Christian beliefs. So, I, as I said, I don't necessarily agree with this, and I think some of the the, the proofs are, are very poor. But still, you're going into the Middle Ages, there's there's lots of things in Judaism which are influenced by Christianity. I mentioned some of the, the customs. Uh, there are all kinds of things that Judaism and Christianity did interact. So it's not that you can't you can study Judaism in isolation from Christianity. What I'm just saying is that the Jewish religion, the bases of the Jewish religion of revelation of the Torah to, from God to Moses on Mount Sinai, and from rabbinic Judaism point of view, the development of the oral Torah, or the, the giving of the oral Torah, and the working of, of Jewish law, working out of Jewish law, 
is really irrelevant. Christianity is irrelevant for understanding these these processes, even if they influence processes. But you can't have anything doing with Christianity without realizing that it's an outgrowth of the Hebrew Bible. Let's not call it the outgrowth of Judaism, call it an outgrowth of the Hebrew Bible. You can't understand... But Christianity is an outgrowth of the Hebrew Bible, you're saying? Right. Well, rabbinic Judaism is also an outgrowth of the Hebrew Bible. But I'm saying, but you can't, just as you can't understand rabbinic Judaism without reference to the Bible, you can't understand Christianity without reference but, to the But what I think you meant in the statement, if I understood correctly, is you could be a Jew in the first century AD and define your entire belief. You might have to explain why the temple was destroyed five years ago, but you wouldn't have to explain anything about Jesus or Christianity. Whereas you couldn't be a Jewish believer in Jesus in the year 75 without explaining some reference of, of Judaism. Is, is that correct? And then even the Gentile believers in Christianity, those who were brought into the fold by Paul and his uh, followers, also had to understand what Judaism was about. But again, I, you know, Judaism is perhaps a, an anachronistic term, but Hebrew Bible, Hebrew theology, the what was developing in the land of Israel until the, the beginning of the Common Era, whether you want to wow. call it biblical uh, Judaism, you want to call it Judaism, you want to call it biblical religion, you want to call it Hebraism or Israelitism, whatever you want to call it, this all set the stage for what developed as Christianity. And one can't understand Christianity without this, but one can understand rabbinic Judaism without reference to Christianity. That's just so profound. It's interesting, and I was thinking about this last night as I was preparing this as a Karaite, can I define my Karaite Judaism without reference to rabbinical Judaism? I don't know that I can in the 21st century, especially since I was raised as a rabbinical Jew. Well, I don't think you could in the 9th century either. It, from the very beginning, from Daniel Kumasi and and, uh, and certainly the 10th century golden age of Karaism in the land of Israel, there's constant references to rabbinic uh, interpretations. And why don't we do it the way they do it? And why, and why is our interpretation the correct interpretation? So whether Charism is a parallel development to rabbinic Judaism going back to the Second Temple period, where Charism is a revolt against rabbinic Judaism in the ninth uh, century. Uh, or a combination. Or a combination, or however Charism developed, it developed in the context of a Jewish community in which the rabbinites were the majority and were constantly in dialogue, not necessarily actual dialogue with the rabbis, but in their internal dialogue with rabbinic Judaism. So that's that would be the case for charism, but certainly the case for Christianity, for understanding Judaism. Uh, in fact, if you get back to the polemical literature a little bit from the Christian point of view, the Christian side, it took them many centuries to understand that the Jews with whom they had contact were not following a religion which they read about in the Bible. In other words, that it was only in the 13th century did, did Christians really get to the understanding that Judaism is a rabbinic religion and not a biblical religion. Can you give an example of that, like of something that would be reflected in their, in their polemics or their apologies? Well, when in the Disputation of Paris in 1240, when the Talmud was condemned as being anti-Christian and certain respect blasphemous and ridiculous, it meant that they understood that the Talmud was the book that Jews used. And in fact, when the Christians, as a result or in the wake of this disputation, burnt the Talmud, they were trying to destroy contemporary Judaism or contemporary Jewish practices. And in 1263 in Barcelona, the uh, disputation where Nachmanides participated, they were hoping to use the Talmud to prove the truth of Christianity. Wow. It's so what a flip in thirteen in 23 years. Right. Well, from burning the Talmud to using it to prove... Well, one could understand them as both part of an attempt to delegitimize contemporary Judaism. So this is fascinating. You're saying, let's go back to Justin Martyr, who wrote around the year 150, uh, Dialogues with Trifone. What he knew about Jews is what he read in the New Testament, and, and it's interesting, he was from Shechem, he was from Nablus, yeah. and he hadn't actually ever met a Jew until this supposed encounter with, with well, Trifon. He, met, uh, he says that. He says, well, he, he makes it sound like Trifon was the first Jew he met, and his response is, wait, oh, you're a Jew? You should certainly accept Jesus, because I found out he's the fulfillment of your prophecies. And he has this shocking encounter that Trifon doesn't just automatically become a Christian. And, and maybe it's a literary device. Maybe he didn't meet a man named Trifon. But um, unless he met an actual Jew, what he knew about Jews is from the New Testament. 
Well, or what he read in the, in the, in the Hebrew Bible. I mean, he knew the Hebrew Bible That's true very too. well. Okay. In fact, try, when you talk about supersession, we'd call appropriation today. In fact, there's a passage where Justin says to Tryphone, he says to him, it's written in your books. And then he said, you know what? It's not your books. It's our books. In other words, he takes wow. over <laughs> the, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, in terms of meeting Jews or whatever, the, he, one has to remember that in the second century, uh, still there's a conflation or, or a combination of Jews and Judeans. Okay. And Trifon was a Judean. Remember, Shechem Nablus is in Samaria. Right. And, he, and, and he mentioned Samaritans, yeah. Right. So these are different geographical areas. I mean, today it's... Uh, 20-minute ride, but Judeans were different than Galileans, who were different than the Samarians. But what you have in Justin is you have arguments from biblical passages. And this is, a, is as I mentioned, the adversus, adversus judeos literature against the, Jews. against the Jews, the Christians, most of them were consisted of what we call testimonia, which are verses from the Hebrew Bible, which proved the truth of Christianity. You mentioned Isaiah 53. I mentioned, let us make man as yeah. the, the pillar of Godhead, the Shiloh passage of Genesis 49, 10. And most of the Jewish polemics are based on biblical texts, which interpreted, answering the Christian interpretation of these texts. So the Christians were arguing against Jews from the Bible. And I assume from your background, you know that in traditional Jewish circles, the Bible is not as important as the Talmud. And suddenly in the 12th Can you say that again? <laughs> I'm saying in traditional Jewish circles, the, the study of the Bible is has been, rel has been given second place to the study of rabbinic literature in the Talmud. So eventually the Christians woke up to the fact that quoting a lot of biblical verses to Jews who are not used to relying on the Bible, but relying on rabbinic literature is not a, a good tactic. So they started to revise their tactics by starting to find material in rabbinic literature, which could be useful either to denigrate the Jews or to say you have proof of, of Christianity. There's a whole book after the Disputation of Barcelona in 1263 Raymond Martini, who was one of the participants there in 1277, wrote a book, Pugio Fidei, The Dagger of Faith, in which he cites multiple rabbinic passages, printing it, or he didn't print it, but writing them in the original Hebrew and Aramaic scripts. And in fact, that's a very important source for textual knowledge of these works, because sometimes afterwards Jews themselves censored them out. So there are passages he quotes from the Talmud that might not be in later manuscripts of the Talmud. Correct. Because of self-censorship. Wow, that's amazing. So one of the things I read in, in, in one of your studies was there were these disputations. Tell us a little bit about the disputations. In the th and this is in the 13th and 14th century, really. Well, there were many informal disputations. People would meet on street corners or whatever. The, Sometimes we actually have a whole literature of uh, humorous literature about Jews and dispute with Christians. But there were some of them were more formal when someone, whether it was a king or a bishop, brought together Jewish and Christian representatives to discuss, to argue. And about, were the Jews eager to participate in these disputations? You know, the Jews were not at all eager to participate. It was a lose-lose situation. If they, if their arguments were better than the Christian arguments, they were in trouble. And if their arguments were worse than the Christian arguments, they were in trouble. But they always try to have a spin on it to show, at least for the internal Jewish works, that their arguments were better. So there were three major ones in the Middle Ages. One was, I mentioned, Paris 1240, which was, in a sense, putting the Talmud on trial. Barcelona 1263, in which the Talmud was used to try to prove the truth of Christianity. And then in Tortosa, which is a city in Spain, in 1413 to 1414, which continued this tradition of proving Christianity from the Talmud, but a major part of the disputation was basically forcing Jewish leadership from all over the Iberian Peninsula into the city Tortosa, which then left free reign to missionaries to go to the communities. Because this is a place that was an, it took a year and a half, unlike Paris and Barcelona, which were just a few days each. This was, and one representative or a few representatives of the Jewish community, this was something that took a year and a half, and Jews from all of the representatives, the leaders from all over Spain were forced to come. So they forced all the rabbis to come to Tortosa, Spain for a year and a half, so they could then go behind their backs and missionize the Jews that was uh, par partially, that was part who of Who had the, no leaders at the time. Correct. 
Wow. Uh, one of the important Christians was Vincent Ferrer, who was, as a, in Christian circles, is considered a great hero because of his... Uh, were they successful? Did many Jews convert? Apparently, yes. Well, we already, in, this was in 1413, 1414. In 1391, I mentioned the riots in which Chastai Kreskis' only son was murdered. Uh, These were anti-Jewish riots? Correct. This was the first time in, really in Spain there was widespread anti-Jewish violence. And as a result of these riots in 1391, which again took over, I, Spain is a little bit of uh, anachronism because the Iberian Peninsula still in 1391 had uh, Andalusia, the uh, Muslim part, but in the okay. Christian parts, both uh, Castile and- What later became and, uh, Spain. Right. Yeah. There were general riots all over it, And a part of that, many Jews uh, were forcibly converted. Ah, so it wasn't that they were convinced by these wonderful arguments. They said, okay, please don't kill me. Oh, well, let's have that the, water the, 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 and baptism. You know, conversion is a very- uh, um, complicated issue. And uh, if I could put in a, a plug for my university, we have here a Center for the Study of Conversion and Interreligious Encounters, which is funded by the Israel Science Foundation as part of the i program, the Israel Centers of Research Excellence. So one of the things that the, the center has been studying and discovering is the complexities of conversion, about how it's not a one-time event, someone suddenly was Jewish and became Christian and fully Christianized. And even in the Middle Ages, when people converted to, to Judaism, this is a process, as it is even to this day. So that how many people were convinced when they were offered the choice between death and conversion, obviously would like to think that the, they weren't convinced, they were just trying to avoid it. It's interesting in Christianity, where Christian law is that one has to be baptized of one's free will if one wants to become a Christian. But when Jews came later to say that they were forced to be converted and they should be allowed to be returned to Judaism, it was argued that at the moment of conversion, even though there was uh, force, they chose to convert rather than to die, and therefore it was by their free will. Wow. So 22 years after these race riots where, where many Jews are forcibly converted, now they come with these arguments from the well, Talmud. all the time they've been arguing. Oh, and, okay. And, and then, of course— But now the rabbis are out of the way and they can, you know, right. attack the flock. And then 1492, with the expulsion of Jews from uh, Spain, it meant that if anybody wanted to remain in Spain, that, that person had to convert. So you have 100 years of growing conversion, converso, what we call conversos, some people call them Anusim, people force converts. Moranos, which was a derogatory term for these converts, their communities are existing side by side with loyal Jewish communities. And Ferdinand and Isabella decide to strengthen Catholicism in Spain. They thought that these indigenous, the loyal Jewish communities were undermining the faith of the conversos and was another reason for the expulsion. Wow. So the public disputations, and there were other examples, were part of the explanatory, Christian explanatory campaign. Now, there are those people who think that in uh, this 1263 in Barcelona, this was not part of a conversionary, uh, there was no conversionary motive. It was a more scholastic motive. I, I don't agree with that at all. It wasn't necessarily part of, a, of an ongoing missionary campaign or conversion campaign, but certainly it was an attempt to undermine Judaism, contemporary Judaism. And since your choices, as we pointed out, were either being Jewish or being a believing Christian. And really and, believing Catholic. Believing Catholic, yeah, then uh, if they, the Christians, the Catholics were successful in undermining Jewish belief, that would bring people to be part of that. And, and this is actually, I, I want my audience to understand this. So Imagine you're a Jew there and, and you hear the two sides in Tortosa or Barcelona and you say, wow, the New Testament really makes a lot of sense to me. I'm, I'm going to be a Bible-believing Protestant. No, you, you get burned at the stake for that. Like, there, that's not an option. Well, Protestantism didn't exist. It, it didn't exist, right. But if you would say, okay, wow, this, this New Testament makes a lot of sense to me. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to accept Jesus as my Messiah and, and, and only follow the New Testament. You'd be executed for that if they found out. I mean, that, that would be worse than remaining a Jew as, as far as your fate, because at least as a Jew, you're tolerated and have extra taxes. As a heretic, you're put to death. Right. But uh, even though by the 14th and 15th centuries, there were certain reforming Christian movements, the Hussites in Czechoslovakia. And how did they turn out? Weren't they all uh, uh, well, they massacred? Were, yeah, okay. they were ex executed. Uh, John, John Hus was uh, burned at the stake. Okay. 
right, so it was no being a heretic was not a particularly uh, healthy thing to be. It was it was essentially worse than being a Jew in some contexts. So so you have this going on where there's blood libels, there's these accusations of the desecration of the host. You have these race riots. You have these oppressive taxes as punishment for being a Jew or a tolerance for being a Jew. And then these people come with you with arguments. It, was this a carrot and a stick approach? You know, this is what happens if you remain a Jew, this, this, all this oppression and persecution. And look, here's, they're dangling this carrot, you know, okay, maybe you don't believe this, but here are some arguments you can tell yourself as part of your cognitive dissonance. I mean, is, is there something to that? Maybe the uh, again we the the reasons for conversion is very difficult to establish. We have a number of testimonies of converts, Jewish converts to Christianity, such as Abner of Burgas or Alfonso de Valladolid, who was a quite prominent rabbi and uh, had a number of writings in Hebrew before his conversion, and then tried to convince Jews and wrote in Hebrew, which most of the Christian works are written in Latin. But the Jews who converted, who wrote about it invariably wrote about it in terms of their the conversionary experience and not i wanted a uh, a i wanted uh, an easier life or anything like that those people if okay. they didn't write or it didn't you have examples of jews who have been forcibly converted to return to judaism or at Even least some jewish leaders wasn't there one of the leading rabbis who fled to fez Okay, so um, oh, uh, no, Rashba, yeah. Yeah, who's who's one of the codifiers of Jewish law, and he had con been forced to convert to, to we, Catholicism. Apparently in 1391 in the riots, but it lasted very, a very short period of time. And he fled to a Muslim country where he could return to being a Jew. Correct. You have another anti-Christian polemicist named Profiad Duran, who converted in 1391 and apparently lived as a, outwardly as a Christian while writing anti-Christian polemics and other works in wow. Hebrew in wow. Perpignan for uh, for decades. It's a very interesting phenomenon. It's very hard to explain how he got away with it. But again, as, as I said, the conversion was a process, and sometimes even the Christians didn't expect the Jews to really... Uh... And it, it was a process that actually took centuries. I, I was in at the Hebrew Union College, and they were um, showing me, they have these documents from, I think it was from the 1700s, and they're in Portuguese, and there are these, these sort of public pamphlets with the names of specific people who were put on trial and convicted of Judaismos, which I guess translates as Judaism. And in, in the ones they showed me, they weren't executed. They would go to jail for a number of years and sometimes for life. And these were people whose ancestors maybe three, 400 years earlier had converted to Judaism, and they were still practicing some form of Judaism in secret, and they got caught. Well, I don't know when the last auto de fe was the burning of the at the Jew I believe of the stake. it was in, in the 1800s, something in, like in that. Very, City. very, very late. And you had even to this day, you have people with Jewish identity who have, who've been families that have been centuries as, as Christians. There in Beersheba, there are a number of people who have come from South America, some of whom think that they have Jewish uh, background. There are people. Who uh, Israelis who are trying to find Jews from all over the world, like uh, either as descendants, so-called descendants of the twelve lost tribes, or people whose uh, ancestors had Jewish blood. There are all kinds of there are political issues involved in this. Also, all these people that are that are found after centuries, or if they want to be Jewish, have to go undergo a uh, conversion ceremony. It's not like they say, "Oh, my great 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 grandfather was Jewish." And so you can't come with DNA, and this is a, more of a political issue, but. You can't come with a DNA test and say, you know, my ancestors were Jews, I have a Jewish last name, give me Israeli citizenship, it doesn't go over in Israel. But as an academic, as a professor, would you say that some of these people from the Latin American world who, who are convinced they have a Jewish identity, they're, you know, I've heard stories of, you know, my grandmother used to light candles on Friday night I don't, and she never knew why, we didn't eat pig on Saturday. I've heard stories like this, that there's some legitimacy in that? I think there is. I think the problem is that research has been compromised by advocacy. In other words, I don't know to the extent to which people found people with so-called Jewish names and said, well, did you, do you like candles in the basement? Or did anybody like candles? Oh, you want to, yeah, yeah, we lit candles in the basement. I think uh, to a certain extent, Ethiopian Jewry is, 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 is similar because from the 19th century with European influence on, European, on Ethiopian Jewry, it's very difficult to figure out 
what exactly what it really was like before European Jewry uh, Jews got there and started discussing with them. So the same thing with with the conversos, so the crypto Jews. How many are actually of Jewish heritage? What exactly they did? I think it's uh, it's very difficult to determine that now. But if someone has a Jewish identity or wants to be part of the Jewish people and is willing to go undergo conversion, then uh, it doesn't really matter whether or not okay. they're... So, so let's, just, let's just wrap up a little bit and go back to some of these polemics. And um, one of the things that you bring out in your articles is that you talk about in, in Southern France that there were Jews who, who didn't start out wanting to write polemics, but they went to study with Christians philosophy, and that led them to write polemics um, against Christianity, which is to me fascinating because like I, I think I started saying before, you know, I think of Jewish Christian dialogue, I'm looking for the common ground and trying to, in some sense, avoid the differences. Say, look, we don't agree on these things. Let's focus on what we have in common ground. And there they, their common ground was, was what we might call Greek philosophy or, or Jewish philosophy, Christian philosophy, and that then led to, um, that interfaith dialogue led to polemics. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, my theory is as follows, that the Provence was a meeting ground for Jews coming from Iberia as a result of the, recon the so-called Reconquista, the Reconquest, the Christian Reconquest of Iberian Peninsula. Jews uh, and also uh, Muslim, the Amuhads and the uh, Muslim intolerance in Muslim Spain, what we call Muslim Spain, Andalusia. Jews migrated to southern France. And in southern France, there were traditions of northern France, even though politically they weren't one unit, but the, the northern France were Talmudists, were, interested, were not interested in theology or philosophy. And the Andalusian Jewish migrants found a local community which did not share many of their intellectual pursuits, and they were able to find them among Christians. They also, these I mentioned Judah Ben Tibon, who had the local clergy at his son's wedding, was the father of the translators, the first one to translate from Judeo-Arabic into Hebrew. And what I'm theorizing is that because of their close relationship with Christians on a intellectual basis or a social basis, that they, in a sense, were, we have Jews who say to their fellow Jews in Provence, Southern France, why can't you be more like the Christians who are, uh, let's say, in their, uh, their uh, spirituality or things like that, in order to make sure that no one would misunderstand their respect for Christian intellectuals, no one would misunderstand it as advocacy of what those Christian intellectuals believed religiously, they wrote these works of polemics or included polemical statements in other genres in order to make sure the borders were strictly drawn between Jews and Judaism and Christians and Christianity. And that's part of a larger, I'd say, theory or explanation of the Jewish anti-Christian polemical enterprise as not being solely a matter of defense of Judaism. The traditional narrative is that Jews wrote anti-Christian polemics and other treatises because Christians pressured the Jews and Christians were trying to convert Jews, and the anti-Christian literature was purely defensive and attempt to ward off these uh, missionary attempts. And I believe that we have enough material especially from the Islamic world where Jews wrote anti-Christian polemics, even though there was no Christian mission to the Jews, that would indicate that there were Jews who wrote works against Christianity for purposes of self-identification or self-definition and not solely as a defense mechanism. And therefore, Provence in the 12th century, 12th, 13th centuries would be one example of this. We have Italy in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, where we have dozens of of Jewish anti-Christian polemics without any real mission to the Jews. It wasn't pleasant for the Jews as the period of the ghettos, but not the same sort of campaign against the Jews as there was in the Middle Ages. So some places, Jewish anti-Christian polemics are a result of Christian missionary activity, and certain places it was just part of the Jewish, I'd say, theological enterprise. It was part of Jewish self-definition. It was what a Jewish rationalist would discuss, because this is one of the threats, the intellectual threats to Jewish rationalism. So that goes back to the quote that you wrote in one of your articles, 
Whereas you know, one can understand Judaism on its own terms without reference to Christianity, but basically you're saying in some instances they you could, but you don't have to. In other words, there were some Jews who wanted to make reference to Christianity to, for their own self-definition. And because this was the the context in which Jews lived, let's say in, in America today. So Jews can live a full Jewish life or whatever, but they still have to be aware of Christian holidays. They have to be aware of the Christian calendar. They have to be aware of, let's say, American customs, American civil religion. It's not a question of the one can really separate oneself fully from society. And the same thing in the Middle Ages. Jews and Christians, even though there were specific Jewish areas and Jewish Jews were were forbidden sometimes for certain areas, Jews were forbidden from certain um, professions because of the Christian guilds. That doesn't mean that Jews and Christians did not interact on a daily basis, whether it was in the, in the marketplace or in, uh, I don't know, the, the, the infirmaries or, or wherever, the, and they knew each other. Jews were often doctors. The Jews were often doctors, but the Christians were doctors. Interestingly enough, the first translations from Latin into Hebrew were of medical texts because Jews, especially in, in southern France, wanted to keep up with the, the newest medical information, wow. and that they could find only in from the Islamic world. I mean, I'm sorry, the Christian world, the Latin Christian world. So the first translate later on, there are translations, uh, Jew Hebrew translations of other Latin works in other fields wow. and theology. And, uh, so, so to reiterate what you said before, if I understood correctly, is so some of these Jews who are interacting with the Christians over philosophy, they, they in a sense were, I would call this, they were kind of overcompensating and in the sense they were saying, look, these Christians really have it when it comes to philosophy and spirituality. And now, lest anybody think I'm promoting Christianity, then they had a lash out against Christianity to, to distinguish, you know, here's what we don't agree with. No, I think it's, it's a question that if you have separate communities, but you have people who are straddling the border between those communities, if they want to make sure that their straddling of the border is not construed by those who are not on the border— as sympathy with uh -huh. the with the religion of the uh, of see. the other side, and, and maybe there were. Do we have evidence of accusations of that sort, where they say you're studying philosophy with Christians, you're no better than a Christian? Is, is there anything like that? I don't think we have such accusations. Remember that the people doing the writing were the intellectuals, uh, the non-intellectuals. Okay, we're not. We don't have. We uh, don't have what they said. Okay, so right. we don't. Okay, very. But I, what I'm saying is that that the impression I get from the fact that. Most Provencal Jewish philosophical or exegetical works include anti-Christian passages. And I mentioned the social relations between Jews and Christians, or intellectual Jews and intellectual Christians, and the fact that these migrants from Iberia were critical of the locals for not being more philosophically uh, engaged. Uh, I put it all together, and I think that there's a uh, one can make the argument that the polemics are written in this context, the context of collegiality with Christians, but not acceptance of Christianity. Can you tell us about your books? You've written a number of books. Well, my first book was my dissertation in which I uh, discussed the use of philosophy in these polemics. It's called Jewish Philosophical Polemics Against Christianity in the Middle Ages. And it was 30 years later, I issued a second uh, a second edition with uh, some updating and some corrections. As I said, there's an attempt to look how Jewish polemicists reacted to Christian theological views by means of philosophy. And the, the Four major topics are Trinity, Incarnation, namely the second person of the Trinity, the Son, became a human being, Jesus. Transubstantiation, which is the transfer, the substance of the bread and the wine become uh, flesh and blood. And the belief in virgin birth, that Mary, not that the birth of Jesus uh, did not uh, stop uh, Mary's virginity. Uh, the second. Wait, wait, just, just to clarify, according to Catholic doctrine, Mary was perpetually a virgin even after she gave birth. Correct. The second book was uh, first a Hebrew edition and then an English translation of Chastai Kreskis's Refutation of the Christian Principles. As I said, this was written originally in Catalan, apparently. It was translated into Hebrew. The original uh, text is lost. So I did an edition of this uh, philosophical polemic by Chastai Kreskis and then a translation into English. And the, my last book that dealt with uh, polemics 
was an addition with Sara Strumza of the Hebrew University of a ninth century Jewish anti Christian polemic, which was written in Arabic or Judeo Arabic, Arabic and Hebrew characters, and which went through many, many, many different textual phases. And we have the Judeo Arabic, we have Judeo Arabic versions, and we also have a Hebrew translation or different versions of the Hebrew translation, which is known as the Book of Nestor the Priest. So we presented all the textual wow. information in the uh, Arabic and Hebrew, and the Hebrew versions also had Latin and Greek glosses, editions, so we did that uh, with English translations. Uh, and then I've uh, published a number of uh, shorter polemical treatises and articles about the place of philosophy and polemics in Jewish intellectual history. Wow, so. amazing. <laughs> So have you written books on other topics as well that you want well, to share the, with us? Well, the other books have been on charism, I wrote. Oh, so. The, Tell, tell us about that. Okay. One book is called From Judah Hadassi to Elijah Basyachi, Studies in Late Medieval Karite Philosophy. Deals with Karite philosophy from Byzantium from the 12th to the 15th centuries and the interplay with rabbinic uh, rabbinite philosophy and the mutual uh, influences. And the latest book is an edition of text written by an 18th century Volhynian Karaite. Volhynia is now part of Ukraine. Simcha Isaac Lutsky, who wrote around 24 books or treatises, died at age 44, so that was pretty good production. Wow. <laughs> um, one of the most interesting parts about him, there are many interesting parts about him, is the fact that he was a devotee of Kabbalah, of Jewish mysticism. A Karaite mm -hmm. Kabbalist. That Correct. sounds like a whole topic for another episode, but fascinating stuff. Thank you so much, Professor. We You're really welcome. appreciate the time you've given us. You're welcome. Shalom. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiasWall.com.